It's no secret that the N64 and PS1 pushed the limits of what a video game could be with the advent of 3D gaming. It seems like everyone wanted to be Mario 64, and while most didn't even come close, it means that 3D platforming fans have no shortage of interesting games to play. Lots of classic arcade-style games were given a chance to reinvent themselves for more modernized audiences too. And while I'm often unfamiliar with the roots of some of these games, when you make it a 3D platformer, that's where I come in. Such is the case with Bomberman. Known for his classic arcade -y... What are you doing, Bomberman? I don't know, I haven't played any of the games. Uh, known for his classic grid-styled gameplay where you place bombs to destroy obstacles and enemies, I guess. There were quite a few entries on N64 based on the classic style of gameplay, but I don't really care about those today. Because Into the Fray enters Bomberman Hero, a blend of 3D platforming and classic Bomberman mechanics tied together with a story and boss fights. Now that sounds like my kind of game. This one's pretty niche and seems to be a bit of a cult classic. I'm not expecting the best game ever made here, but if I can get some fun platforming with creative mechanics, I'd say this little experiment was a success. So is this little cutesy platformer, The Bomb. Well, let's dive right in and check it out. Developed by Hudson Soft in 1998 for the Nintendo 64, Bomberman Hero is pretty story heavy with cutscenes connecting and contextualizing the linear levels and boss fights. As a result, I'd say it's pretty important for the story to be good in order to emotionally invest the player. It's mostly self-contained with only minor references to other Bomberman games in terms of setting, but most of the characters are new so it's pretty accessible to new players, which is good for a new genre that will likely attract new players. So the story takes place in Bomber Nebula, where White Bomber, aka Bomberman, it's more like a race and a character at the same time, so I'll just call him Bomberman, lives on planet Bomber. But the Garadin Star, the base of the Garadin Empire, appears and attacks the galaxy. Princess Million and her robot companion Pybot set out to enlist the help of Bomberman and co, but their ship gets abducted. So the princess gives Pybot a stolen disc to give to Bomberman while she turns herself in. This is Star Wars. I can't tell if it's supposed to be subtle or not, either. Regardless, it's pretty simple stuff. Bomberman is training at the bomber base, is told to check out a nearby UFO, meets up with Nitros, the edgy rival that kidnapped the princess, gets Pybot's message, and goes on a chase across the galaxy to catch Nitros and rescue the princess. It's an effective setup that establishes stakes and a reason to go on an adventure. Nitros looks so cool, too. Definitely a memorable rival. And yeah, most of the plot from here on out is that Bomberman defeats one of the four devils of Garadin, basically the bosses, but Nitros escapes to the next planet and Bomberman must follow. It's a linear plot that keeps the player moving and bringing them to different locations, complementing the level structure pretty well. Bomberman has to traverse linear levels with simple platforming and puzzles that utilize bomb-based attacks. This is what's supposed to make Bomberman Hero stand out from your Mario, Spyros, Crashes, and Banjos. But, uh, the movement in this game has some creative ideas with a lot of flawed execution. First of all, the controls are about as simple as you can get. You run and you jump on platforms until you reach the goal. Bomberman feels kind of floaty, but the momentum is all wrong. On the ground, it's pretty tight, but you gotta fix slow speed. But when you jump, your air control feels slippery. It's not the worst thing ever, nor did it cost me any deaths, but it's very vanilla, so the platforming isn't intrinsically satisfying. Here's the thing, good movement can make or break a platformer's sense of pacing and agency. Like in Mario 64, Mario's moveset and sense of momentum give you a wide range of control over the gameplay and pacing, creating a high skill ceiling and making the game super replayable. The game becomes about finding creative ways to navigate these small sandboxes and collect things in a fast and optimized way. Or you can go the Crash Bandicoot route of having simple, tight controls and focused platforming sections where skill and challenge create engagement. Bomberman Hero finds a bit of a middle ground. It's linear levels, but not Crash Bandicoot linear. They incorporate simple platforming, combat, and puzzles. Like I said, the platforming itself is slow, so unfortunately the base platforming fails to be as tight as Crash to make its simplicity fun, but lacks the depth of Mario 64. But puzzles and combat is where the bombs come in. You can place bombs and kick them in a straight line, with a slight homing property to make combat flow better, but you'll mostly be throwing bombs on this sort of arc. Enemies can't be hurt by jumping on them either, so ranged combat is required. The challenge comes from lining yourself up so that when you throw bombs, they hit the enemies. 
Now I don't think this is inherently a bad thing, but in execution, the game seeks to limit more than it empowers. First, throwing bombs in this sort of arc just does not feel that intuitive. Hitboxes can be inaccurate too, especially on bosses. Aside from lining up shots, you can also jump over enemies to place a bomb mid-air to defeat them, or kick one from afar. But I think that this more tactical method of combat just does not suit a linear platformer. You're also punished for being too aggressive, since you can be damaged by your own bombs without a power-up. So the game incentivizes a very specific, defensive style of play in levels that are somewhat open within the confines of a linear platforming stage. I'd say the combat tries to have the same appeal as Mario 2, the turn at Mario 2 that is, throwing objects and using the environment around you to gain the advantage over your enemy. In concept, it should tie the platforming and combat together, but in execution, it just doesn't. I think this could have been remedied by creating more ways for Bomberman to interact with things in a 3D space. Give me more ways to throw bombs so I can have a wider range of trajectories at my disposal. Perhaps a quicker straight shot that is short range but easier to be accurate with at a mid range. Or a pop fly to hit enemies above you. Kicking is too slow and you can charge up to throw multiple bombs, but that's too slow as well. These sorts of moves are more suited to the puzzles, which aren't really puzzles as they just boil down to finding a key or bombing a switch. So the limited movement isn't really justified by the puzzle solving either. It just comes down to the movement being oversimplified and the combat being too limited and unintuitive, and is made more tedious by the level up system. You see, your bombs have a blast radius, so there is splash damage to compensate for the range, but that has to be upgraded with power ups which reset upon a game over. And because of this game's progression and scoring system, you will be dying a lot. You can't rank from 1 to 5 at the end of each level based on how many points you get. You can build up your score by collecting gems, power-ups, and defeating enemies. So a perfect score in a level often means combing these stages for every last gem in enemy, which tanks the pace in. In addition, there are these attic bombs, which are fun to collect but overshadowed by the points. Think of the crates and gems from Crash Bandicoot. For bosses, the score acts as a timer that counts down, so you need to defeat the boss quickly to get a good score. Oh, and did I mention Bomberman Hero requires perfect scores and all attic bombs to access the final planet and true final boss? On one hand, completion is optional, but as someone who values completion, I usually take the quality of all the main content into account when I determine the overall experience. So when you have a slow, oversimplified platformer that seeks to limit the player and punish them for dying and progression that further slows the pace by requiring perfection, it's rather tedious on paper. It's supposed to be balanced by rewarding skill with better bombs, but ruins the experience for new players. Because if you take more liberties and try to comb the levels to get the perfect score, thus playing as intended, you'll have worse bombs most of the time due to dying more. It all culminates in having to backtrack for upgrades when the perfect score on a boss is really difficult for your base firepower. The game isn't even the most difficult thing in the world either, but it's so demanding that playing by its own rules to get the full experience will often result in a clunkier experience as a whole. I feel like permanent upgrades would have definitely worked better to reward exploration. It's not like the power-ups feel like upgrades anyway. You've got the bomb and firepower tokens, you have extra lives and the life jacket which makes you immune to your own bombs for the rest of the stage, but you also have three extra types of bombs and a range extending power gloves that makes it impossible to aim. The problem with stuff like this is that it's not toggleable and is only countered by getting a regular bomb upgrade. You've got these remote bombs which can be detonated with the Z button which is pretty useful and cool. There are ice bombs, which freeze enemies into a block that can be used for platforming, which is useful, but again, you lose your regular bombs. And then there are these salt bombs, which kill these slugs, and these slugs only. Your bombs are basically useless, and you need to save a regular bomb item in the level to make sure you kill every enemy. It's just annoying because it means you have to backtrack in the level to get regular bombs back. This is why permanent upgrades would have improved the pace. If I could switch between all these items on the fly, then they could be seamlessly integrated into the level design and the combat would have more depth. Here's something else. You can actually increase your health meter as well by collecting 200 of these blue crystals. I did this once, and then died, and it reset. It also resets if you turn off the game. Why would you even make it work this way? Once again, the game is just limiting the player in stupid ways that make it a slow platformer. That is easily my biggest problem with Bomberman Hero. And it's a shame because if the system's mechanics were more intuitive and less punishing, the game would have been so much better, since the level design and atmosphere is really good. Bomberman Hero borrows from the Mario 3 school of thought for its level design, meaning that the levels are fairly short and focused on one concept or challenge. 
This is one of the best approaches to level design a more linear game can have in my opinion. A variety of good ideas that are still consistent with the base gameplay in short bursts helps keep things fresh but grounded. You'll have stages where you simply need to get to the end whether that be through going forward, to the side, up, down, or all around. And there are also levels where you need to find a keycard to open a gold door, or four crystals around a confined sandbox. Or find this power up that lets you pass through a wall. Some levels have multiple exits that lead to other stages too. What I like about these is that they're short enough to be completed very quickly if you're good, but can take a while to master. If it weren't for other factors, this would create a lot of replayability. But yeah, the platforming levels are some seriously good stuff. My only gripe is some waiting, like this one desert stage where you ride the platforms. Thankfully the core platforming stages have the least of it, and are mostly well paced and creatively varied. But the bosses and side stages do slow down a bit more. And yeah, platforming isn't the full story here, there are also side stages with different gameplay styles that utilize the power gear. If you were scratching your head and wondering where the forced vehicle sections were, yes this was 1998 and the 6th generation of consoles was fast approaching where these types of tropes were super common, then you've come to the right place. Bomberman Hero features four types of gear. You've got the Bomber Marine and Bomber Jet, which become these linear shooting stages. The Marine is used in these underwater hallways where you can swim and fire torpedoes. This thing is slow, and the relatively short levels feel the most drawn out here. I'd say the combat can get pretty clunky too, such as the Frozen Lake level. Oh boy. Let me rant about this stupid level for a second. It sucks. The stalactites home in on you, and you can't even see them since they're so high up, so you have to wait and backpedal to dodge them. On top of trying to collect items and defeat every enemy with these annoyingly placed traps, this level is an example of really tedious pace-breaking design. Good thing the scoring is a bit more lenient here, so you don't have to do everything, but it's just a slog to get through. And as the game progresses, these marine levels just feel more and more slow. And while the bomber jet is a linear shooting stage like the marine, it's more of an Arnrail Star Fox type level. This one feels way faster paced and much more exciting than the former in control and set pieces. I honestly think they should have just turned all the marine stages into jet stages as it's simply the superior mode for linear shooting stages. Substituting exploration for shooting skill would definitely give the player a break from the slower paced movement and score requirement of the platforming stages, which is sort of what these variety playstyles are supposed to do anyway. The bomber copter is unique though. It's more of an overhead view where you hover and drop bombs from above. It's more sparingly used and nothing special. This stage where you descend into a volcano is kinda cool, but the one where you destroy all the turrets from above is kinda mundane. Other than the unique boss fight that uses it, it's just padding and variety for the sake of itself, but it fortunately doesn't overstay its welcome. Finally, there's the bomber slider, which might be my favorite of the selection. These are basically snowboard stages where you navigate a linear platforming course. The turning could be a bit less slippery, but it's sparingly used yet exciting and a fun break from the action. While some of these can be fun novelties, the Bomber Marine is used by far the most. And each playstyle is so inconsistent to the base gameplay that it won't even appeal to everyone. It's variety for the sake of itself. That's why I like to applaud variety within the core gameplay, which is consistent yet fresh to stay engaging. And on that note, I'd like to mention Louie, this game's attempt at Yoshi. I guess this guy's from previous Bomberman games, but in Bomberman Hero he plays more like a standard platformer. You can jump high, wall kick, and jump on enemies. No bombs in sight. I like Louis' design a lot, and he's fun to play. I like the slider, it's kinda consistent with platforming, but used sparingly enough to remain a cool novelty. And finally, we have the bosses. They'll take place in a closed arena where Bomberman must fight a variety of foes while the timer ticks down. Here, a swift victory is the key to getting that score of 5. And there's a good variety of fights here. You got the recurring Nitros fights where he jumps around on this game board that dictates and telegraphs his attacks. He dodges your attacks really well so you sort of just need to time your bomb so he lands on them or spam them until you get a hit. Each fight introduces new attacks and hazard spaces on the board. I do think his later fights can be a bit cheap where he gets his own bombs since he can instantly place them and detonate them without giving you a chance to react. Weirdly inconsistent since all of his other fights are based around telegraphing attacks. But overall, most of these fights are fun, engaging, and challenging. The other main bosses are larger enemies in more standard areas. You basically just need to dodge their attacks and throw bombs at their weak spots. Pretty standard stuff, but the combat is applied much better here. It's better suited for bigger targets in smaller areas than the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. But like I said, the upgrades create a really inconsistent experience when you're casually playing the game and not trying to maintain firepower. It's so tedious when all you have to work with is a tiny blast radius and you have to wait for your bomb to explode in order to throw another one. 
Hitboxes aren't really consistent either. There are times when a hit registers when my shot was way off, and other times where I'm spot on but don't damage the boss. And remember, you do not have time to waste here. Your health resetting to 4 units also doesn't help since most players will be stuck at the lowest health for the entire game. Another annoying thing is that health carries over between levels. If you end a stage with 1 health, you're probably dying next level. For a disconnected linear levels and a health system that punishes death so much, you could at least start the next stage with full health. Although eventually I realized that just quitting a boss when I got to 1 health to maintain my firepower and lives was a better option than dying. But it's just another unintuitive aspect of this game. But in order to dive into the bosses deeper, I'm gonna need to discuss the more spoilery part of the game. The cutscenes in Bomberman Hero are pretty static, and the writing and characters don't make the plot that entertaining to follow. But I can at least appreciate the plot development that happens over the course of the game, even if it takes a bit of a backseat in the middle. Princess Million is just a generic damsel in distress character. She's basically just used as a reason for the Garrodin Empire to lure Bomberman to them since he has the disc. Which is at least a developed plot point later on, but sometimes I wonder why the princess doesn't do more than just stand there. And that's sort of applied to a lot of the characters. The plot is structurally sound and effective, but it's the static character interactions that hold it back. It's the plot of Star Wars without the iconic characters. A good story, bland plot. The ending kinda picks up though. I like how new villains are foreshadowed, and that's where the most engaging plot development happens. Endel, Baruta, and Bulban are pretty simple monster guardian type villains, but it's the fourth one that's teased early on when she ambushes Bomberman from the shadows and is eventually revealed as Nadia. She disguises herself as Million and Bomberman gives her the final disc. Also, is she dressed up as Million or is she a shapeshifter or something? Like multiple times she just has these like random powers that just happen and it's never explained. And Nadia's fight is one of the limits on bombs really frustrated me. You fight her spider-like robot, Cronus. The missiles it shoots are pretty difficult to dodge, and the hitbox on its face is annoying at the base firepower. And then you destroy it and fight Nadia herself, who kinda jumps around and tries to whip you. But there's a lot of waiting for her to jump around when time is of the essence to get a good score. And that's true for a lot of these fights. The bosses have way too many invincibility frames. It just wastes time. I spent way too long on this boss, and it's when I started to become more frustrated. But Bomberman is tricked into giving up the final disc needed by the Garrodin Empire, and after defeating Nadia, it's revealed that the evil, the sinister, the powerful Lord Bagular will be revived. Now at this point, I was like, am I supposed to know what that means? I thought this was a self-contained story, and now this critical Bomberman lore is being dropped on me. But I pressed on and sort of ignored it, since I was more focused on the gameplay. But Bomberman saves the princess, who is safely returned to planet Bomber, and makes his way to the death- I mean Garrodin Star. Meanwhile, Nitro survives Lord Bagular, who chuckles like he's showing you some unfunny meme that he finds super hilarious. <laughs> Let's backpedal for a second. This is supposed to be a dramatic moment. But in a game that is of a completely different genre with a completely different appeal that tries to have an involved story, you need to expect that there will be people who have never played a Bomberman game such as myself playing for the first time. Instead, I had to research who this dude was, and it's not that deep, just replace him with Dr. Wily or Eggman or Bowser or something. He's the main baddie that Bomberman fights, his arch nemesis. I guess he was defeated in previous games, and then he gets resurrected here. This isn't at all different from when Andros was shorned into Star Fox Adventures, but with Bomberman there's so many games that playing those specific ones to understand the plot significance in a game with a completely different appeal is just weird. If this was the plot to Bomberman 64 instead of the platforming spin-off, it would make sense. This is supposed to be a big moment, the return of Lord Bagular, or Bagura, or Bagul- Why does this do have so many names? But Garrodin is a new concept of the series which tries to develop itself, which makes Bagular out of place compared to the other characters. It's just one plot point that should have been engaging if it was explained a little more in a game that really could have used a great moment like this. But another plot twist is soon to follow. Bagular revives the Devils of Garrodin, and after defeating Nitrous again, it is revealed that he was actually a Bomber-based trainee, and that he was brainwashed and used against his will, and now he joins Bomberman as a good guy. So is this supposed to echo the Darth Vader is Luke's father reveal or something? Because Bomber-based trainee... this dude is basically the intern. Doesn't carry the same weight as, like, your father. 
This is a bit of a sudden plot contrivance just to shift the stakes toward the main villain, and is inconsistent with how Nitros was built up as this super cool character. It's like now he's reduced to nothing. I like the idea of the twist, but it needed more build up. Maybe some foreshadowing during the first three planets while we're chasing him, or explore his backstory a bit? I mean this dude looks way too cool to be low level trainee. There had to be something more compelling you could say about him. I like Nitros. I like him a lot. But he could have been done better. Although some people are saying this is optional since you can fail his earlier fights and he doesn't get saved if you run out of time. If this is true then I guess the story has to account for both results since he kind of just disappears for the rest of the game. Still, I stand by wishing that more was directly done with him. But yeah, all the other bosses are revived off screen, so this entire area is just refights. But unlike your standard boss rush, I actually like how this is executed. They really made an effort to format the boss differently or give them new attacks, so they all feel fresh. Nitros' fight is just the logical evolution of his other fights, but Endel's fight has this pool of water where you have to jump when he sends electricity through it. Baruta is fought in a standard arena instead of using the bomber copter, so his attack patterns are translated to the regular gameplay style to add some freshness. Boban is underwater now? This one is dumb. You gotta use the marine and his attacks are annoying to avoid. You basically gotta go to the end of the hallway and then spam him with bombs on the way back. At least I think that's the strategy. It's generally clunky. Cronus gets its own fight though, where it pops out of the lava and attacks you. It's a new boss fight though, but some of his attack patterns are slow, causing good times to be somewhat luck based. Although I did find a way to manipulate his attack patterns based on where I stood, which seems to be a thing for other bosses too. But yeah, I'd say most bosses in the game have certain attack patterns that make them easier to hit or are just slower. So fast times can come down to randomly getting good patterns and saving a couple seconds. Along with the hitboxes, bosses are just too inconsistent, which will definitely come up later. And Nadia's fight is just two of her in the second phase? This is what I was talking about with the shapeshifting thing. Is this like stuff she can just do? It's never explained. I don't know, she's really cool and could have been a fun villain with more development. And after those rematches, Bomberman finally confronts Bag whatever his name is. So it's a three phase fight. The first phase, you just throw bombs at him as he dashes after you, teleports, and sends out this shockwave thing. Pretty easy, and you can manipulate his AI into dashing around the screen repeatedly instead of his other time-wasting attacks. This is the first inconsistent aspect of this fight. For his second phase, he transfers his soul into a TV or something, and then multiplies, and you have to hit the correct one. This part honestly could have been removed, and nothing of value would have been lost. Like, it's fine as a fight, but waste time, which you need a lot of in this fight. It's just too random. Like you can hit him immediately as he descends, or you can waste time trying to bomb the correct one. And I guess the way to tell the difference is based on the one that doesn't laugh. I usually just bomb the one closest to me for a one third chance to get it right and then waited for them to move into a crowd if I got it wrong. Then I just bombed the horde. Although the hit detection can be annoying on this one. And then finally the actual boss starts, where he becomes a giant mech. You gotta bomb the arms and then the main body. This is the most consistent phase, as his attacks are actually well telegraphed, except I think the missiles are a bit much. Overall, this fight is so frustrating if you're trying to get a good time. I thought Nadia was bad, but this fight was so annoying. Remember when I said you can quit fights to retain your health in bombs? Well, that information saves between phases here. So if you get hit once on phase 1, get to phase 2 and quit, you're retrying with 3 health. Get to phase 3 with 1 health, good luck retrying that now. I got so tired of backtracking to the first world for upgrades that I just brute forced it with the base stats. It was annoying. But basically you defeat Bagular and Garadin explodes. Then the Bomberman team that shows up like two times manages to escape the explosion and return to Princess Million, where Bomberman receives a medal of honor and a kiss from the princess. And then the game ends as the main cast waves to the audience of, well, basically a field of T-posing models. Love it, Star Wars is quaking in its boots right now. As I alluded to previously, there's actually a hidden world and a true ending. If you collect all the attic bombs and get a perfect score in each level, you can access the Gossic Star. This is three levels, and with all the minor annoyances and limitations I've discussed up to this point, this is just too demanding. If you go into the game with that knowledge, it just slows down every level to a crawl. And if you didn't know, well now you have to do a ton of backtracking. It's just very tedious, and apparently this is more so in the western release. Yeah, you've heard of games being more difficult in Japan, but it's actually the other way around here. I guess enemies have more health, there are less pickups, and the score requirement is stricter. 
So now in many levels you basically need every possible point which is super annoying if you die or just can't find like one gem. In some stages you need to climb on some weird edges too. I like little secrets like this but reserve them for the attic bombs. If anything they could have been hidden better. Not the basic collectibles meant to guide the player. And it's not every level. I genuinely had fun with the shorter levels, but some levels and some power gear levels are just so tedious and slow. But if you can slog through all of those perfect scores, you get access to Gossip Star, a few short levels where it's revealed that the nefarious, the evil, the diabolical, the puppeteer running the scenes all along was the ultra powerful Evil Bomber. And here we go again. Okay, so who is Evil Bomber? Apparently he's the villain of Bomberman GB3, a Japanese exclusive on Game Boy. And apparently Gothic Star is a destroyed version of the planet from that game or something. So I can understand making Bagular the villain. He's the main guy, and he's not difficult to grasp even if you've never played the games. But Evil Bomber is a completely different story, as in nobody outside of Japan would know about this, completely killing the reveal. And remember, it's Western players who have to work harder to get to this reveal in the first place. I don't know, it just seems like Bomberman lore is very messy. Bomberman fans, is this true or not? Am I completely off the mark here? So Evil Bomber, I guess his name suggests that he's the evil version of Bomberman, is mad that Bagular was defeated and wants to defeat Bomberman himself. It's basically just Uka Uka. So Evil Bomber was the one that set the attic bombs. Attic is the dimension that you fight Nitros in, and that is literally all I can tell you. What an attic bomb is is never explained, and I have no idea what happens when one explodes. But Evil Bomber set them, so I guess good on Bomberman for taking care of that. And then you just fight Evil Bomber and the day is saved again. It's not a bad fight, not nearly annoying as Bagular. He has a lot of ways to dodge your bombs, but you need to get a feel for his movement and defeat him in a timely manner, which is how I like my Bomberman hero bosses. Kinda reminds me of Meta Knight in a way too. But then the boys congratulate you in the most soulless way, and the gang returns home after another successful mission. Okay, so this story is interesting, to say the least. Like I said, it's structurally sound with a static presentation that holds it back, and some poorly conveyed, albeit interesting, plot twist near the end. It's a fun little time, but it fails to be engaging as it could have been. And in a game where following the story determines the gameplay, it sort of brings the experience down. Most of my amusement was seeing how much the game could possibly rip off Star Wars, but if the writing was better and the characters were developed more, the boring and generic cutscenes and confusing plot points wouldn't have overshadowed the interesting stuff like Nadia's reveal or Nitros' redemption. I'd say the best part about this story is the world building. Despite levels being disconnected, you really get a feel that these are real environments and that you're journeying through them. Mainly issues that they're kind of barren of civilization. Bomber Base and Millions Castle are the only two lively locales, and you don't see any civilians. Well, I guess aside from these boys at the end, but in terms of contextualizing level locations, it's great stuff. And the atmosphere it creates is generally the story's greatest strength. And aside from the main campaign, there are also a few side stories and modes. You get these from gold medals, which are obtained by having perfect scores in each planet. So even if you don't unlock the final boss, you do get rewarded with goodies for what medals you do get. I like that at least. And there's some neat extra content here. There's gold bomber mode where you play the marine and jet levels on foot with this gold suit. It's like this side story and you're told to just defeat the Sea of Trees boss. No reason. And there's a unique stage with these rainbow waterfalls too. It's annoying because you have to use that stupid power glove and it's easy to fall. But it's still a cool thing to have on the side. Although Slider Race is awesome, since it's that one scene from the intro with the snowman. And yeah, this intro is so cool. It definitely does a good job at establishing the game's identity, with Bomberman as this Power Ranger type hero with all his gadgets and his secret base. But yeah, you just replay a slider level and it's a race. These don't have much of a point to them, but they're just cool little bonuses. And then there's a sound test, pretty self-explanatory. And we'll discuss the soundtrack in a second. And then you have Million's Treasure Hunt, which might have been my favorite part of the game. It's a little side story where Million enlists Bomberman's help as some treasures stolen from Garadin were scattered across the galaxy after the transport ship they were on exploded. Essentially it's the attic bombs, but they look like treasures and their locations are shuffled. I don't really like how you're dropped into the world map and need to play levels until you find them, but the levels are short and they aren't too hidden. To me though, this was such a refreshing change of pace. I already got all the medals, and I could play the game without obsessing over every little enemy and item. The pace was great and the gameplay was so fun. 
My criticisms of the basic controls and underdeveloped combat still persist, but the level design still shines, and it's a fun little treasure hunt. Although for some reason you still have to view the points summary after every level, which is really redundant. After beating a world, it tallies up your points, but it happens for every level you play after that. It's an annoying nitpick, but it's there. But the game actually has three more secret levels obtained by mashing the start button during the intro. You were supposed to use the turbo function on the Joycard 64 controller that Hudson released. It's a neat little reward for using their controller. But I'm glad it's unnecessary so I can regularly access it. Because the levels are kind of neat at least. It takes place on Bomber Star. It's the moon on planet Bomber that resembles that little pink thing on Bomberman's head. But yeah, just three more platforming stages with varying set pieces and styles. This one with branching paths above a pit with these clowns. This labyrinth, this more linear one. They're kind of random, but visually distinct. I like them, and it's just a neat little retro gaming novelty that would probably cost 99 cents a level today. And that's the bonus content. I'm not sure if it was worth getting all those gold medals, but at least they did add little hidden secrets and rewards, aside from the true ending. They're neat. I guess if you're playing the Japanese version, it would flow a little better, and would therefore be worth it for the lower point requirements. I don't know. And as I've touched on so far, graphically the game has a ton of identity, and a really unique atmosphere. The character designs are all decent, Bomberman's design is cute, simple, and distinct from all the environments he's in. He really does make a good platforming mascot, so it's not like Bomberman Hero doesn't fit, even if it was a weird experiment. The set pieces are a mix of natural, urban, futuristic, and straight up abstract themes. Since this is an N64 game, the geometry is certainly simple, and the textures are blurry since they're just kind of smeared onto surfaces, although the more natural set pieces are still simple, so the cartoony and colorful style still prevails, and it doesn't look as much like a blurry mess as it should. Not the best looking N64 game, but it uses its limitations well and designs creative areas around them. Simple color palettes make areas pop, which helps in identifying platforms and Bomberman himself. The fixed camera perspective also means that what the player sees can be controlled to make the world seem more detailed. Like the forest levels are inside these boxes, or there's just a skybox but the camera view is limited so some levels can seem bigger than they actually are which certainly helps with immersion. Some levels just look wacky though, like this purple one or some of the sky ones. I like it when fun colors are used to create memorable areas. It's a good balance of groundedness and cartoony areas which is sort of expected when traveling to other planets. No environment ever gets visually stale, which definitely helps to save some of that pacing which is lost by some of the design flaws. The only issue I came across with the visuals was more of a technical problem with playing an N64 on a modern flat screen TV. You may have noticed this grey border on the world map. This is usually hidden on a CRT, but since they didn't extend the background to the overscan area, you can clearly see it on a flat screen. The gameplay is fine but it's noticeable if you play the N64 version on a modern display. If you're going to play on a flat screen, I'd recommend the Wii Virtual Console version since it was fixed there. But if you're going to play an original cartridge, I might recommend this one on a CRT. And the soundtrack is honestly iconic. The samples used seem to be unique to this game instead of using that common N64 synth slash trumpety kind of noise. The sound samples feel a lot more crisp. And the songs just have a really fast paced beat with catchy tunes. There's some techno sounding tracks with some other synth sounding melodies. Can you tell I know nothing about music? But the highlight here is easily... Redial. Yeah, that one. Such good stuff and so catchy. Honestly, one of the catchiest songs on the entire system. There's some other catchy tunes, but Redial just sticks out in my head the most. I guess the main Bomberman theme is mixed in there too for good measure. Honestly, this soundtrack definitely helps to craft the unique and weird atmosphere this game has. It's upbeat and happy, but fits the techno space adventure kind of vibe they have going on.
It just has a ton of imagination put into it. And that's the major takeaway I have with Bomberman Hero. It's weird, it's creative, it dared to experiment and use the advent of 3D gaming to bring a classic game somewhere new. It doesn't capture the tight challenge of Crash or the flow of Mario 64. It definitely has some pacing issues created by the punishing Western release's artificial difficulty, and from trying to shoehorn some Bomberman standards into the combat instead of optimizing it for a 3D platformer, some levels and bosses are slow and frustrating with too much waiting. The story is an unapologetic Star Wars parody which is either dumb or charmingly cheesy. Thought the writing is stale which makes most cutscenes uninteresting except for where it picks up at the end. But the plot twists kind of fall flat if you haven't played a select few Bomberman games in the giant sea of them, which isn't the best choice for a platformer which doesn't have the same appeal as those other games. But the level design is mostly concise and focused. When it's not being overly limited, it's cozy and fun. It's an enjoyable little game to sit down with, and even if it's flawed, I can see why it's considered one of the more niche, but cult classic N64 platformers as a result. I think I'd recommend this more for Crash fans than the Mario 64 fans. It's got exploration, but not too many collectathon elements. It's more like Mario 3D World, if anything. It's far from groundbreaking, and Bomberman hasn't tried anything since. It also didn't really make me want to play any other Bomberman games outside of a mild interest if I got the chance. But if you want a decent 3D platformer on N64 with some creative levels, you could certainly do much worse than Bomberman Hero.